Hey folks, Randy Newberg here with another episode of Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, today is a very cold, cold day in Montana, like it is across the rest of the Rockies. And uh, before we get into the topics of today, which is going to be about how you can go elk hunting every year and why you should go elk hunting every year, uh, my guest on this podcast, again, is he's getting to be quite the regular is Marcus Hocken. Uh, (laughs) Marcus, as many of you know, is our field producer for the TV show and all of our, our YouTube content. Also a a serious hunter himself. And uh, Marcus, I think we're in trouble because on one of our previous podcasts about a month ago, we talked about how the Rockies, if we could just escape one more brutal winter, it's going to be the best deer hunting in a decade. (laughs) And what are we dealing with? Yeah, I think it was negative 15 this morning when I woke up. Yeah, ever since we did that podcast, it's like we jinxed the weather. Yeah. In fact, out on Hunt Talk, on the forum, those guys are blaming me. Oh, nice. Yeah. They're like, see, Newberg, you open your mouth, you start talking about this great deer hunting we're going to have in 2017, and along comes old man winter. Yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Uh, Anyhow, apologies, folks. If... If we have a brutal winter, you can blame it on me <laughs> or blame it on Marcus. You don't have all of his email and contact information. So. <laughs> yeah, either way. <laughs> <laughs> so blame him. But uh, anyhow, today, there's a couple of reasons why we chose the topic that we're going to talk about today. One is today is the day that Wyoming opened up its applications for elk. Uh, if you're a non-resident applying for elk in Wyoming, you have until January 31st to get your application in. And January is pretty much the kickoff of application season. And for those of you who do the craziness of what I do, uh, and apply in all these many, many states, uh, you almost have application season. <laughs> and Marcus, is he's, he's dove into it to some degree, um, but he's not not been responsible for having to acquire 10 to 12 tags a year. So you've, no, no, uh, just a little bit. Just yeah. In Wyoming and Colorado is only the only other states besides Montana that I've applied. Yeah, and, so. and Marcus and I are spoiled because we live in Montana, so we're going to hunt elk every year because yeah. we... As residents, we can get it over the counter. But we posted a YouTube video where we wanted everybody's feedback out on our YouTube channel. We said, tell us what you want us to to talk about or do YouTube episodes for. And a lot of the content was almost, or a lot of the comments were were something related to, I'd like to come elk hunting, but I'll never have the money. I don't know how to apply. It's so complicated, blah, blah, blah. And... We, I guess, we've already done a bunch of that content on YouTube. Uh, with kind of how to apply, how how each state works, is right? It? Yeah. Last year we did that whole elk talk series where we broke down state by state. Yep. How the system works. So the thought is that if we do a podcast telling people kind of how the overarching strategy is to go elk hunting every year in at least one state then they can go to the YouTube channel and watch those elk talk videos. And uh, hopefully whatever state they choose, we've done a good enough job of explaining it out there that they know how to kind of navigate the, what I call elaborate schemes of Western elk applications. Yeah, and for sure. The, uh, anyone who, who it doesn't live in the West, most of the other states, east of the Mississippi, east of the Rocky Mountains, don't have these elaborate schemes of bonus points and preference points and squaring points and loyalty points. It's like, who comes up with this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> it's intimidating. I mean, getting on, even knowing, I grew up with Montana's drawing system, so yeah. I, I knew that my whole life pretty much. Right. But then going to another website, another state's website to try to figure out how to apply. Yeah. It's intimidating. It e- is. Even knowing Montana system, looking mm. at Wyoming or Colorado, it's like, oh man, I got to read all of this stuff. Got to figure <laughs> out what these numbers mean. Where do I find what these districts are? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It, it is. And so that's why we did the 
the elk talk series last year kind of given people at least a head start when they jump into that and so now today i want to focus on answering these questions that we got because we posted that as a youtube video but then we also linked it on our facebook page and our instagram page and uh, over the weekend i was surfing through kind of what those comments were and uh there is no doubt that people are intimidated like you like you just mentioned or maybe not intimidated but at least overwhelmed yeah whatever word you want to put to it mm-hmm. uh where to the point where it's so confusing that if you don't live out here and kind of eat and breathe and and live it, it it's it's like where did they come up with these crazy ideas so the idea is that when we're all done in about an hour and a half anyone who doesn't live in an elk hunting state will know how they can come and elk hunt in the West this year and every year. And if you live in one of the states like Arizona, uh, Nevada, to some degree Utah, Colorado, or not Colorado, California, and New Mexico where everything's on a draw, um, I guess Utah there is a few general tags and there's an opportunity to hunt elk on the general tag, but it's, it's a short season. It's pretty compressed, but... If you live in one of those states where it's really hard to draw an elk tag, there's no reason you shouldn't go to one of the other states and elk hunt. And we're going to focus on Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Colorado. Uh, and we'll, we'll also talk about New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Nevada. Uh, and some people will call me and say, Newberg, why do you never talk about Oregon and Washington? And the reason I don't is because for the non-resident hunter, those states aren't very accommodating. Uh, and their elk hunting is very crowded, short seasons, expensive for the non-resident relative to the opportunity. So not that I'm picking on those states. It's just for our audience, I want to give them the best places to go. Yeah. Get the most bang for their buck and have the, the greatest opportunity for success. So this podcast, I, I don't know when it's going to release because in my other life, my CPA life, I've got sucked into being a CPA too much in the last two weeks. So if this podcast gets delayed a day or two, my apologies, folks, you can blame the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> But year-end at a CPA firm is not a fun time. You can't get an extension for December 31st. Uh, it's, it's, so I know some of you are saying, too bad, Randy, I don't really care. Get these podcasts out on, the, on a scheduled basis. But uh, please grant us a little pardon because Marcus and I, and, and we almost don't want to tell our wives what the weather will be like when we're gone versus <laughs> where we're going. But in a few days, we're leaving for Arizona to go hunt coos deer, javelina, and quail. And I'm sure it's not, tonight it's supposed to be, what, 14 below or 18 below, something like that? I think like so. That. I don't think we're going to have that down in southern Arizona. I, I was looking at some <laughs> temperatures down there this week. It's like getting up into high 60s, 70 degrees down there. Yeah, <laughs> but the good part of that is when we're down there, we've got a whole bunch of podcast stuff scheduled, and right from there I go to the SHOT Show. At the SHOT Show, I'm doing a podcast with two crazy guys, uh, Fred Eichler and Kyle Lamb, so... We might have to rename the podcast, you know, Comedy Act, uh, Hunt Talk Comedy Act or something when those two guys get on there. Um, so we're definitely going to have plenty of podcasts that keep us on track and on schedule uh, as we go forward. But uh, if this one's a day late, my apologies. Um, but before we get into how everybody can elk hunt every year, uh, the this year again we've got the same great sponsors for the podcast so ryan coolers uh they got a bunch of new stuff that they're coming out with in 2017 if you haven't go out to oriancoolers.com and see why we get such great use out of those coolers check out the new stuff that they got going on oriancoolers.com i guarantee you you'll want to buy one on x maps uh They've got a bunch of new stuff coming out with their apps, a bunch of layers, new states, new features. Uh, go to onxmaps.com, and they it's just all this planning that we're going to talk about in elk hunting. You, when we talk about 
why I choose this unit or that unit. Where am I getting my research to make that decision? Onyx Maps is just a critical part of that research when I'm at home. But then when I'm out in the field, it's, I mean, the old don't leave home without it. Yeah, thing. I, it's super handy. I was looking at it uh, last week just on the app at home just yeah. to look at Wyoming hunting districts because I'm not really familiar with the Wyoming hunting districts. Just zoom out and scroll down, look and yeah. find where each district is. And yeah. it's just right on your phone. Yeah, and when we get to talking about Wyoming, and it'll be the first one we talk about, um, I'm going to give away one of my secrets. And some of you have emailed me, like I got an email the other day, Randy, you don't have to give away this much information on a podcast. People can figure it out themselves. It's like, well, yeah, I know that, but part of our job is to help lower the hurdles. And so when we talk about Wyoming, we'll get into how Onyx Maps really lowers that hurdle. And then uh, the the other great sponsor you've heard us talk about it is GoHunt.com, their insider service. Uh, they just came out with a whole bunch of updates for 17. Uh, they just got the Arizona draw odds uh, posted over the weekend. And Arizona is... The, that deadline is coming up there right after Wyoming. And we're going to get into more detail on the next podcast about Arizona. But with these Arizona draw odds that they posted, I went and compared their draw odds because they've finally figured out how to do draw odds for the crazy system Arizona has. Arizona has the most funky, <laughs> crazy system for how they allocate tags and do the drawing of anybody to the point where every research service has thrown their hands up in the air and say, here's the simplified odds. Well, I went and compared the Go Hunt Insider Draw odds to all the other services, and it's crazy how different it is. Really? Yeah. Huh. Well, where with some of the simplified services, I'd be like, oh, I should draw a tag in that unit every three or four years. Nope. <laughs> I'm going to be lucky if I draw every 10 years. So huh. it, it was that revealing. So uh, they're getting ready to put their the Oregon draw odds up there. Uh, now they have draw odds for uh, year after year. So you can compare 15 to 16, and they're going to keep stacking that on there. So a whole bunch of really good stuff going on with uh, Go Hunt. They're, they're also getting the, uh, the private public land percentages in there. So you'll be able to filter okay, I want a unit that has 60% public land. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So there's a lot going on there. And if you subscribe to The Insider and you hear me talk about it, and the reason I do is because it's like one of the critical pieces here of of all the research and applications we do. Uh, Go to gohunt.com insider, and if you use the promo code Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, you're going to get a $50 Sportsman's Warehouse gift card. Um, And I can't forget about this is Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, Leupold, uh, they're just great supporters of everything we do. Coming out with a bunch of cool products in 2017. We got to play with some of those products in 2016, and we've had to keep our mouth shut. Um, and uh, they're sending me all new scopes to put on all my rifles, which... I, I always have some trepidation when someone does that <laughs> because it's like, these work so good. Yeah. Why, why do I got to replace them? Well, we want you to be using the latest and greatest. And so uh, at Shot Show in two weeks, they're going to announce all these new products. So I still got to keep a lid on it for a little while. But uh, we'll, 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 Are you going to record a podcast about it down there? Um, you know, it'll probably come up when I'm with Fred Eichler and Kyle Lamb. Uh, but they asked for my address when we're down in Arizona because oh, yeah. they're shipping me some more prototypes on the binos. So nice. Well, we'll get to play with those. So anyhow, we'll just get on with this. So we're going to talk about uh, a strategy of how you can elk hunt every year, but we're also going to kind of coordinate it with the state by state chronological order of how every state comes through the drawing process. Uh, Marcus, you're what, 26, 20? Yep, 26. 26. Uh, and you'd mentioned that you've applied out of state in Colorado and Wyoming. Yep. Um, and like a lot of people, there there is a thing called budgets. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> and some actually someone on hunt talk asked me what my budget was for tag applications every year so i went back and looked at the financial statements and our costs after getting our money refunded and everything averages between 10 and eleven thousand dollars a year wow. and that's because we have the tv show we have to yeah, get mean, this many hunts so i i don't expect anyone else to have a 10 or eleven thousand dollar a year <laughs> tag budget <laughs> <laughs> or if they do uh good for them um but there's also just time constraints with work with family with yeah everything no, it's else hard. It, so what we're trying to do, and Marcus and I talked about this before we turned the podcast on, we're going to almost pretend that Marcus is living in Kansas or Texas or Georgia or someplace where you got to travel to hunt elk. Mm-hmm. And we're also going to understand that Marcus is 26 and his employer makes him work a lot in hunting season. <laughs> <laughs> this and is true. <laughs> that uh, he doesn't have a $10,000 budget for tags. So hopefully in this scenario, Marcus is like a lot of you who are listening. Um, so part of it's going to be about how do we make sure everyone know, understands where they can go elk hunting every year. And then we're going to go through each state and say, these are the little nuances. These are things you need to know as you're putting together both a short-term strategy, but then a longer-term strategy. Because let's face it, if your budget allows, everybody would like to hunt Nevada at least once or twice in their life or yeah. Arizona or Utah or whatever. But um, I remember when we filmed the, uh, the hunt or the elk talk series last spring, one of the videos that we got a ton of comments on was the preference point versus bonus point system. And getting to your point of how complicated and overwhelming this is. Yeah. You mentioned the bonus point system in Montana and you mentioned Colorado, which has a preference point system. So people need to understand there's a big difference between bonus points and preference points. And we did that whole video on it, but yeah, just briefly bonus points are like buying raffle tickets. It's, yeah. You just get another name in the hat essentially. Right. And then there's also squaring in certain states, yeah. like, at least Montana. <laughs> yeah. So you, Nevada. So yeah. Why do you bring that up? Marcus? Gosh, well, we're, we're trying to simplify this yeah. discussion, but yeah, it's a, it is a good point because let's just use it. Nevada, for example, if you've got four points and I've, I've got 10, they square that. So they square year four gives 16 plus mm-hmm. your current year application gives you 17 random numbers. If I've got 10, they square that. That's 100 plus my current year application. That's 101. So the, these, everyone else who has 10 points also has 101, 101. chances. So yeah. there's this like... So it's like, has it really done anything And when you have lots of people at the high point levels? Well, one thing I think that to me that that means, and I'm not the greatest with statistics, but entering that with your one point you are at a great disadvantage right. to the person who has 10 points right but then the person who has 10 points isn't really that right. ahead of anybody else Anyone who else. has all the yeah. i mean I, yeah, to I me it's, the squaring system uh, these states have done nothing to really marginally improve the odds of the high point holders and have seriously diminished the opportunity or the odds of the low point holders. Mm-hmm. I, I better not get into my dissertation about point <laughs> systems. I, I wish that I would give up my double digit sheep points and goat points and moose points in multiple states. And I mean, I'm at the top. Of, I'm the one non-resident with max points for pronghorn in Utah. I've got 18 points for bison in Utah. I would give up all of these points I have everywhere if states would just go back to straight drawing, just that's you know. saying something. Yeah. It's a lot of time, <laughs> yeah, research, t- money, <laughs> everything going into all that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, I, I look at it and I just don't know that a lot has been accomplished. And I can see right now, if we, if this was a live call in show, the key, the, the, the switchboard would be lit up with a bunch of pissed off old gray haired guys <laughs> saying, what do you mean? Well, what I mean is, None of us are, there's a finite amount of sheep in the world Mm -hmm. and you can come up with every elaborate scheme you want. Point systems don't work that well for high demand species or hunts 
early elk hunts in Arizona or because you just can't churn enough people through there. So mm-hmm. you, you can come up with every kind of crazy strategy, scheme, uh, complication you want. You're really not until you double the number of sheep on the mountain or double the number of elk in the hills. That's the only way you're going to double somebody's odds. Yeah. Schemes and, and strategies don't do it. <laughs> so anyhow, preference points. Colorado has a true preference point system. And we, we did that podcast a while back from that elk hunt in Colorado that we did last year. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was a preference point system. I had 19 points and under preference points, the guy with the most points gets the tag. Yeah. That's although, is there a certain percentage? Cause isn't it in some States, a certain percentage of, (laughs) <laughs> those right are, are you, which, which, obviously you're going to be better at explaining it no but I, you're right you bring you bring that up so wyoming 75 percent of the tags go into a true preference point draw okay and 25 percent of the tags go into just a random draw so they throw everybody in the preference point draw and if, even if you have zero points you're still in the preference point draw it's just that you're not going to draw there yeah. So everybody who didn't draw in the preference point system gets thrown over into the random draw the, for the other 25% of the tags. So the new guy with zero points in the random draw has every, he's got the same odds of drawing that tag in the random draw as the guy who had 12 points over in the preference point draw. Okay. So but you're not completely out of luck in, in true Wyoming. preference point, or I guess Wyoming. Yeah, Wyoming. In okay. Colorado, you're completely out of you luck. You are. Okay. Right? So there's no point to apply for a unit that takes five points if you only have four. There's like no... Right. And, unless you think that, you know what, this year a bunch of people are going to not okay. apply for this unit. Okay. But if, if you have two points and it took five last year in Colorado, you're kind of wasting your time. And because of these complicated schemes, that's what forms my strategy to say, no matter, and, and let's, let's have a couple premises to this, a couple baseline things. Let's say someone's budget is a thousand bucks for applications and tags that, okay. that they might draw. So if you only have a thousand dollars for, for your tag budget, obviously, uh, I, I wrote an article four years ago about how to go elk hunting for a thousand bucks. And you can do it if you really want to be on a shoestring and you want to split costs with a bunch of guys, uh, or gals, and you're, you're willing to just hunt, uh, one of the less expensive States like Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do it for a thousand bucks and, but now Colorado's raised their fees some. So, and with inflation, maybe now, all right, you could do it for 1200 or 1500, but anyhow, that's not what I want to, I don't want the thousand dollars to be the total budget of the hunt. I want it to just be, all right, I got to start somewhere with some budget of applying in these States. Yeah. I think that would be kind of an interesting thing is like, what is the threshold of, like how low can someone go with their budget? I think right. a lot of people would be interested to know how, yeah. like how, what's the bare minimum I need to apply for a Western state to go elk hunting. Right. And so that's, that's where I came to this thousand dollar number. And I think when we go through this, people will understand how I came to the thousand dollar number is New Mexico for the really good elk hunts. They have what's called standard pricing, which if it's not a high demand hunt, it's a little under 600. Okay. But if it is a high demand hunt and it tells you in the regulations, you know, like the Gila and some of the other places, Oh, this is HQ, which means high quality or high demand. Then it's a little under 800 bucks. Plus you've got a $65 license. You got to buy in New Mexico. So, Here's kind of the, in my concocting all of this, why I've come up and I'll try to explain how I came up with the strategy. And you'll probably ask questions because I make a lot of assumptions of knowledge that everybody else has been doing this for 25 years like I have and, and they haven't. So when I jump over something that I think, well, I just take it for granted slow me down and i'll, I'll I, try <laughs> okay I, yeah, I worry if i mean i'm sure there's some listeners out there who might i mean the, they, whole, they might have more the questions. whole western state processes is complete you know new thing right so that's hard it's, yeah. and, i mean because i i did grow up in montana's you know applying for tags right 
in so Montana, you, but yeah. Yeah, when you grow up in any of the systems for limited entry tags, I think, yeah, it helps you with some basic, mm-hmm. you know, the idea of w- how it works and, and where you can maybe yeah. leverage this part of it or that part of it. So, yeah, but try to be that. Yeah. objective uh, Wisconsin guy or Pennsylvania guy or whatever, someone who who's coming out here who really... Yeah, I don't know how basic we need to get. I mean, right. just like in the terms of like, there are different areas of the state that have different units and right. there's going to be different limitations on each of those units yeah <laughs> that's like the basic yeah we could this <laughs> could this, this could be a 10-hour podcast yeah we, we gotta but I'll, we're gonna try make to, some assumptions that hopefully right and the, yeah. and, and so it, you make a good point marcus we can't go into every bit of that yeah but out on our hunt talk forum we have a complete section of the forum dedicated to tags and applications that i would put hunt talk at the top of the list of people who understand these systems and are willing to help people yeah um so if if you want more detail go there or go to the youtube channel randy newberg hunter and watch the elk talk series we give a lot additional information there and then also go to every one of the whatever states we talk about go to their websites download the regulations or like some of them call on call them drawing proclamations but whatever it is it's yeah. whatever term they put on it download that and read it and plan to be completely and utterly uh <laughs> well and i think done. that the states are getting a little better that some of them you you'll, you'll notice there's a tab for like hunt planner and and you still have to figure out some of the things to understand the hunt planner but right. it, it is yeah. i think it's getting better and i think I, it'll continue to get better i do i think in the last two years wyoming has made huge improvements in their hunt planner yeah um and uh the other part is Go Hunt. Uh, if you sign up for their insider, they've got a, a place there called Base Camp. Okay. And it has every state's deadlines. It has links to all the regulations, but it also has really, really good explanations of how each state works. In fact, I tried to do that at one time when I first took over Hunt Talk. And it became such a maintenance headache. I'm like, you know what? These states change the rules every year. I, yeah. I just, I, I need can't, a staff. I, I can't, yeah, I can't do this. So, uh, the the base camp part of of uh, Go Hunt is where I go to now if I'm checking deadlines or whatever. So, it, it and part of it just comes with experience of of applying and researching and learning and figuring out. So, but if you got a thousand dollars here's here's what i'm going to suggest you do and everyone's going to be mad at me because they're going to be like newberg you're going to screw it up over in this state or that state so the premise is let's find a state that doesn't have a point system so that gets it down to one of two states idaho and new mexico are the only states without a point system okay and if you don't draw there let's figure out where your other options are after the draw all right and and that's that's the short-term plan but in the process how do you take some of that budget and build towards a longer term plan mm-hmm. when a longer term plan i'm talking four or five six years down the road so and this is where i'm gonna get my first piece of hate mail <laughs> um if if someone doesn't have points um you're really relegated to the uh the counting on the random side of things in Wyoming, you know, we said that 25% of the tags go on the random draw. Mm -hmm. So if you have no points, you still have a chance there. Or you apply in Idaho, which there's no point system, so you have a chance there. The downside of Idaho is to even apply, you have to buy a non-refundable hundred and, I think it's almost $160 now, license. Okay. That you don't get your money back. So then you look at New Mexico, which is a no point state where even though I've been applying there for 20 some years, the person was zero first time ever applying in New Mexico has the same odds I do if we apply for the same unit. And you have to buy a $65 license up front, but you can check the box that says, if I don't draw, please refund my license money. 
Okay. Whereas Idaho, it's not refundable. So that's where I make the distinction between those two states without point systems. Okay. And then if I can jump in with a question. Sure. So the first thing that pops into my head with Idaho and New Mexico as not having points, Mm -hmm. are there units in those states that I have a decent chance of drawing? Like, I mean, am I I still only going to have a 10% chance of drawing one unit or a certain unit? I, I mean, I'm sure there's a variation, but are there units that you can draw the, you know, or you have a good chance of drawing every year? That's, uh, the answer to that is no. Okay. All right. <laughs> At least not in the limited draws. And that's why, um, I, I mean, well, let me restate that. There are some places where your odds are pretty good. Okay. And it might be 20% or 30%, but there's a reason why those odds are 20 or 30%. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's a huge amount of private land that makes it very complicated to get around. Well, I don't want somebody to invest their money in a in a unit. Oh, well, yeah, my odds are good, but when I get my tag, I'm not going to have a place to hunt. Mm-hmm. So, to the areas with good amounts of public land, um, the answer is it's tough. Okay. Uh, but in each of the states, you can get your odds to maybe be a little better if you're willing to hunt with a bow or a muzzleloader. Um, All right. And so. If if the odds are really low, there's probably a reason why the odds are really low. It's a high quality hunt with a lot of public land, with low hunting pressure, with high quality animals. Okay. If you're willing to say, you know, I don't need to go hunt the biggest bulls on the planet. My this is my first elk hunt. Um, you know what? There are areas in all of those states that give you an opportunity, better odds, and you're still going to have a fun hunt. Okay. So So that would be kind of what I'd be curious about is some uh, like opportunity hunts. Like, I know I might not, I'm not going to shoot a big bull, but hopefully find some elk and be able to hunt, maybe shoot a raghorn or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Right. And I think once we get past the discussion of limited entry draw, kind of rolling the dice, then when we get into the, okay, here are some options of where you can just go hunt Mm -hmm. because you didn't draw in one of these limited entry states. Those will be kind of the raghorn or just you know, okay. be happy with any elk kind of thing. All right. So like right now, we're right. distinguished. This. Right. <laughs> we're so, talking limited entry right, right now, right? So okay. right now, Good. we're going to swing for the fence. This, right. this is, okay. And I always tell people, you know, Babe Ruth might have hit 714 home runs, but he struck out 3,200 times or 3,300 <laughs> times. So understand you're going to strike out more than you're going to hit home okay. runs. So <clears throat> I'm... If I had a thousand dollars, this would be my strategy. I would go to New Mexico and I'd buy the $65 license and I would say, the, the, and because you have to front the money in New Mexico. Okay. So if you only have a thousand dollars, this is really your chance to, to put it somewhere. Now, some people might say, well, I, I want to do Wyoming first. And this is how the calendar kind of falls. At Wyoming, the deadline is sometime in, uh, uh, let's see, January 31st is the yeah. elk deadline. It's it's different for deer and antelope. So we find out usually the third week of February. So you're going to find out if you drew or didn't draw in Wyoming. So if, <clears throat> if, if you're willing to front the money to Wyoming and bet that, well, they might refund my money before the New Mexico deadline, or they may not. Yeah. Some years, Wyoming is kind of slow about that. Okay. So if if you can talk your spouse into, look, honey, there might be a couple week overlap here where I'm fronting a little more than my $1,000. <laughs> Here's what I would do. I would apply in Wyoming before the January 31st deadline. I'd go, I well... I mean, I, I'm just right here with my computer. I've got the go hunt draw odds for Wyoming here. And what I would do uh, is I would go and find which, and you can sort it by random odds versus regular odds, uh, preference point odds. So I would go and find which hunts in Wyoming have the best random odds. And in the regular draw, which is less, uh, I think it's like $600, Wyoming has also a special draw. If you want to pay more money, like 500 extra dollars, 
you can go in what they call the special draw. It's the same tag. <laughs> it's just that in one, you're, uh, you're going to pay a lot more money just for the fact that you got most of the time better draw odds. Not always, but most often. So here's, here's a strategy that, that you can do. Just know that uh, you're going to have this. Uh, well, you may not have your money back if you don't draw in, <laughs> in Wyoming. Uh, by the time you have to apply in New Mexico, I'm, I'm a little distracted here because I'm trying to, here we go. I'm on my computer. So what I'm doing is I'm uh, looking up the random draw odds here for Wyoming. And I'm just going to pull this up real quick and see if you have no points in Wyoming and you have, let's see, we're going to do the non-resident regular and we're going to do it for elk. So, and I'm not going to give away all of my <laughs> my ideas here, but if you want to archery hunt, I mean, you look at that. Some of the random odds here in these archery only seasons, 33%, 12%, 7%. And you can tell which ones are are the highest demand ones by how low the draw odds are. Yeah. Um, 5.8%. So, yeah, you're not... <laughs> <laughs> your odds are still pretty low. Well, then we get into all of the rifle hunts. Uh, and you can see that the random odds are, you know, there's one that's six, almost 6%. Um, yeah. There's one, I've hunted this unit, that one's 11% all in right. the random odds, uh, 10%. So you still have a chance of drawing in Wyoming mm -hmm. in this pool of 25% of the tags that goes in the random draw. So let's do that. Let, let's tell the person, send your money to Wyoming by January 31st. Look at which units have the best random odds and pick one that, that makes sense. If, Although a flag that I just thought of is right. the wilderness, uh, Ooh, yeah. the wilderness rule to make sure, even if there's yeah. a lot of public land. That yeah, Marcus brings up a good point. In Wyoming, and this is saying we're on a budget, um, non-residents as a general rule there there's an, a slight exception to this if you have a wyoming resident come with you but most of you aren't going to be able to do that uh to hunt in a w designated wilderness area not just national forest but it's got to be part of a designated wilderness area there's a big difference there you need to hire an outfitter so good point because someone will look at that and say whoa look how good those draw odds yeah, are. i'm, I'm gonna just try try there <laughs> trying to not going too far of a tangent, but just throw right. that flag that, up. That's a good point. So go to Wyoming, send them the fee of, I think it's $585 or something like that in the regular draw. And the deadline is January 31st. You're going to know whether or not you drew by like, I'm looking at a calendar here, probably by about February 20, 20th through the 25th, you'll know. And here's where the downside comes. You may or may not have your refund by the time the New Mexico deadline comes up. Let, let's assume that you you could have your refund by the time the New Mexico deadline comes up. Or at least be able to front the money knowing that you will have the refund. Right. Yeah. By the, mm -hmm. And I mean, I do this all with a credit card. It's the easiest way to do it. And most of the states refund it back on your credit card. Mm -hmm. So I just pay off my credit card every month and don't worry about it. Um, but some people might be, eh, well, hopefully by the next billing cycle, that's been credited back to your account. So you're, you're safe. Yeah. Um, you might have some explaining to do on the home front when someone says, what is this $585 charge to Wyoming game and fish? But <laughs> so that, that's where I would start if you're willing to take that risk. If you're not willing to take the risk that Wyoming or you need the money back from Wyoming before the New Mexico deadline, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe just say, you know what, I'm going to have to forget about Wyoming and I'm going to jump right into New Mexico. Yeah. But so wh whether you take your chance on Wyoming or not, the next step is New Mexico. 
And the New Mexico deadline, it, it varies each year. Sometimes it's in late March. Usually it's in late March. Uh, sometimes they at sometimes it's been the first week of April. But let's go with it being in late March. And that's where the risk is that you aren't going to get your money back from Wyoming in time. But go buy your $65 refundable New Mexico non-resident hunting license. Check the box that says, I, uh, I want to have my money refunded okay. if I don't draw. And then to your point, Marcus, of are there areas where you can expect good draw odds in New Mexico? My answer to that is in the places I would send you to go and hunt, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't. So I'm just looking right now at uh, the New Mexico draw odds. The archery hunts in New Mexico are some of the highest demand hunts. Okay. Because it's prime rut. It's they're just a lot of reasons why people want to go there. And so I'm looking at some of the hunts of places that I would send people to apply. And the odds vary from, well, if you really want to swing for the fences, apply for one of the Gila second archery tags or one of the first rifle tags there. Uh, your odds are going to be 1% or less. Um, but if you don't need that, back to your point of, hey, I don't need you know the premium premium. I just want to go. Yeah. Um, there's some places where your odds get closer to 10%. Um, and if you're willing to hunt with a rifle, uh, in some of the later hunts that are out of the rut, uh, the, the elk have been pressured. You're, you kind of get the leftovers for lack of a better term. Um, there's some hunts then that you can get in on that have odds of, you know, 10 to 20%. Okay. So, and I'm just scanning that here to, as, as we're talking, looking at uh, the draws on the insider here. Um, yeah, if you're willing to hunt some of the later seasons out of the rut or even quite a ways away from the rut, okay. there, there's some decent hunts there. So let's assume that New Mexico comes and goes and you didn't draw that. So you haven't drawn Wyoming. You haven't drawn New Mexico. You've got... Wyoming, they keep like a, a, a fifteen dollar application fee or something. New Mexico keeps kind of all of these states charge some. Yeah, you're gonna want to know what what's your total out of pocket if you right. don't draw. Right. Of so these states. on both of those, you're you're gonna be out some money. And back to Wyoming, uh, eh, you know they they have a point system, and you can check the box that says I want to apply. I want them. If I don't draw, give me a point. And they add $50 to your fee. Yeah. So whether you do it when you apply or later in the summer, you can you can buy a point from Wyoming, I think from like July through October, or July through September. And that's part of the long-term plan that we'll get to. But out-of-pocket costs where you're going to be. So you started with $1,000. Right now you're out-of-pocket probably a $15 application fee in each of those states. Each state it averages 10 to 20 bucks. So we'll just go with 15 across the board for all the states. So you're only out $30 okay. for swinging for the fences in two states. Yep. Now you didn't draw. So now it's time to say, all right, I'm not, I'm not hunting one of the glory units. How can I go out hunting this year? All right. And that's where it gets to, I, I'm going to focus on three states primarily for that opportunity. And uh, where I would suggest somebody go would depend on whether they want to archery hunt or rifle hunt. Okay. Um, so say, say I want archery hunt. Then. Okay. Let's start there. All right. <clears throat> and, and Marcus says that because every year he shoots his elk the first week of archery season. I don't know about that. No. <laughs> well, this year you did, you and your yeah. wife both. And I've seen some pictures of some big elk you've shot with your bow. So... I, I expected that would be your your first <laughs> uh, uh, priority. But yeah. let, in the three states we're going to consider for either over-the-counter or leftover hunting are going to be Montana, Colorado, and Idaho. Because I, those are the places where after the draw you can still go hunting. So that gets to our point of there's no reason to not be hunting this mm -hmm. year. So if someone wanted to archery hunt... Uh, over the counter, no draw, no anything. I would rank them in this order. 
Montana, Idaho, Colorado. Um, right. In Colorado, uh, it's the, the the reason that I'm not a big fan of the Colorado archery hunts, the general ones, anyhow, is because you got muzzleloader hunters in the woods at the for, same time. At the same time, for a peak part of the period, huh? And it's okay. pretty crowded. So, for archery, I'm going with Montana or Idaho. Okay. So, what's your cost? Um, in Montana, we've had about 2,000 leftover elk tags, non-resident leftover elk tags every year for the last four or five years. Uh, there was a ballot initiative where the citizens r- significantly raised the non-resident price. Well, mm-hmm. supply and demand, alternatives of where to spend your budget, th- that reduced the demand for Montana. But that number's getting less and less and less every year. Yeah, didn't they sell out on the first day this year? The deer tags did. The deer tags, okay. Yeah, the elk tags, they they still had quite a few of the elk tags. So, And here's why I put Montana ahead of Idaho is Montana has some really excellent elk quality. What happens in in archery season is, you know this, and you're probably going to kick me under the table saying, shut your mouth, Randy. (laughs) But like a lot of places in the West... Our public land is the high country. Mm -hmm. Our private land is the low country. And in archery season, where are the elk? I mean, yeah, a lot of them. There's there's a lot of them up in the high country, but... You, yeah, you might still see some on private, but right. But getting... but your your access to elk in our archery season in Montana is way better in archery season. Oh, absolutely. Than it is in rifle season because in rifle season, hunting pressure and weather yep. has a tendency to push a lot of the elk to the private sanctuaries. At least that's been my experience. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. and you're going to find exceptions to these guidelines everywhere. Yeah, everywhere, but yeah. generally <laughs> speaking, yes. Yeah. Yep. And in Montana, our archery season for elk opens the the Saturday before Labor Day. Yeah, usually the first Saturday of September, is that what it is? Yeah, yep. usually. And it runs for six weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so there, and I'm trying to remember what, do you, I, I should know this, but because I don't apply as a non-resident, do you know what our elk only license it's like 800 bucks. Yeah. And if you want to add the deer on top of that, it's like another 160 it's, bucks. It's up there. It's If you want the elk and deer combination, it's close to 1,000, which is this budget I'm working, I'm trying to work with. Yeah. But you can get the elk only part, which is if you want a couple hundred dollars less. Yeah. So it, to your, your point, if someone was archery, wanted to archery hunt, Montana would be my first choice. Mm-hmm. We've got... Lots of elk in lots of places, even though everyone, you know, anyone who didn't get their elk is like, ah, the wolves ate them all, or, you know, they're all on private or blah, 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 whatever. I mean, I'm the same way. When I don't fill my tag, I'm like, there's got to be an excuse. Come on. It it can't just be bad luck, or it can't just be, I didn't put the pieces together. But uh, we we have excellent archery elk hunting here in Montana. Yeah, Um, you're going to... There's, it's going to be hard not to find some elk right. in a lot of places in yeah. Montana, especially you're going to hear them. <laughs> right, is, you're going to hear them. And, which is the cool part. Yeah. In Montana, you know, one of the th- things that I, I remember when I first moved here in 91, I think it was in 92 or 93, uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks held a bunch of open houses in Montana. And it was just kind of a, here's the state of the union of elk hunting and motorized travel. Mm-hmm. And I remember the one they had here in Bozeman at the Holiday Inn. They they kind of said, all right, all these other states around us are having the same issue of how motorized travel is impacting elk vulnerability, which impacts age classes and has this whole domino effect. Mm-hmm. We're at this point where we're asking you as hunters, do you want us to work with the agencies to have uh, – either temporary or permanent motorized travel restrictions? Or do you want to let motorized travel continue to grow at this really rampant pace? Because in the early 90s, that was like when everyone wanted to get a a four-wheeler. We went from the old Honda ATC three-wheeler to now a (laughs) four-wheeler. And and so it was really a a period of rapid growth uh, of off-road travel. And they said, or your other alternative is, we can work with the agencies, the federal land management agencies for seasonal travel restrictions, permanent travel restrictions, 
And each of these have a different outcome. One outcome is we don't do anything and pretty soon we're going to be shorter seasons, pick your weapon, limited entry tags, like a lot of our neighboring states Mm -hmm. are faced with. Or if you're willing to have some travel restrictions, we can keep six weeks of archery. We can keep five weeks of rifle. We can have lots of general tags. Most of the state can stay a general area. And uh, I remember at least in the meeting I was sitting in, I... I don't think anybody raised their hand and said, we want shorter seasons. Yeah. I think everybody's like, no, we, we want our 11 weeks of general season. Point of that is when you do come to Montana, um, the, the motorized travel restrictions, some people are frustrated by that. Mm-hmm. But that's what allows for really long seasons and lots of tags and a lot of opportunity. If, if we were like some states and we let every road be wide open all year round, we'd have such vulnerability of our elk that yeah. there wouldn't be any elk left. I'm so. a fan. <laughs> Mark, <laughs> yeah, and people, I, I've always been a fan of it also. And people are like, you just wait, Newberg, someday when you can't get around, you're not going to be a big fan of that. You know what? When that happens, I think I'll just hang up my my bow and my rifle and say I had my choice or my chance. But so the reason I say that is I've in in the years of doing this, I've had lots of people email me, talk talk to me at trade shows or seminars and say, you know, I I came to Montana, but dang, half the roads are closed. Well, yeah, they are. But that's why we have the opportunity we have. And and we give away... What is it by statute? We got to give away seventeen thousand or seventeen thousand five hundred uh, non-resident elk tags okay. every year. I wasn't it, sure, but yeah, yeah. So we give away a lot of them. Uh, so that to your point of if I was archery hunting, I'd pick Montana, and if not Montana, say it's coming from Washington or Idaho or Washington or Oregon, and Idaho's closer. Yeah, uh, maybe I'd think about Idaho. Idaho still has great archery hunting. Okay. Idaho has more public land than Montana and doesn't have quite the level of uh, private public complications that Montana has. Okay, mm. and is there quite a few general districts yeah. that you are allowed to? You would be allowed to archery hunting. Yeah, okay. yeah. There's a lot of places in in Idaho that are uh, general. Just go buy your tag, off you go. At least for the archery season. Cool. So. Right there. If if you don't draw in Wyoming, you don't draw in New Mexico, you, and you're an archery hunter, you got Montana, and you got Idaho. All right. And, and if you what want, are people looking at for costs in Idaho? Uh, costs in Idaho, um, you're looking at uh, the non-refundable hunting license, which is I think 160 bucks, something like that. And I should have all this in front of me. Um, maybe I'll be able to pull it up here real quick. Um, but uh, let's see, state rules and regs. Here we go. Uh, Idaho. Okay. You, you think I would have all this memorized, but I, I don't. <laughs> well, that's what I, you know, so, I've been pretty elk. impressed with your <laughs> memorization. So of costs. your elk tag, your non resident elk tag in Idaho is going to cost you, at least if Go Hunt is. Yeah, they've got it up to date here. Uh, $416.75. Your non-refundable hunting license is $154.75. So you add those together and you're looking at about 570 bucks for the the elk tag plus the non-refundable license. Which is license. significantly less than Montana, really. Yeah, it, it is. Let That's me, what I was kind of curious about. Um and so let me go to Montana. Just trying to steer more people to Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, be careful. No. <laughs> Marcus makes a good point there. Be careful if the uh, the guy you're talking to tries to steer you somewhere else. He <laughs> might be pulling the, the old bait and switch shell game here. Okay, Montana, the elk only this year is 851 bucks. Yep. So, and Montana will tell you, well, that includes uh, upland game and fishing and small game and blah, blah, blah. Um, maybe you'll take advantage of it. Maybe you won't. And Montana will say, well, you can come for archery for six weeks and then you can come back for rifle for the five-week general season. And all that's true. It's just, I don't know how many non-residents take advantage of 
of all the extra goodies Montana kind of requires that you buy. So the one for archery elk hunting that I would definitely take advantage of is the mountain grouse shooting mountain. <laughs> shooting mount, <laughs> if you if you're getting into mountain grouse, you're probably in elk country, and, right. then, and you can thwack one of those with an arrow. That's yeah, pretty. and and Marcus and I both have this grouse problem. Um, I, I don't know how else to explain it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There is not a grouse on the mountain that is safe if I have a bow or a shotgun in my hand. And like we said in the last one of the podcasts a while back, I'll shoot them out of trees. I'll shoot them on stumps. I'll shoot them on the ground. I'll, I will shoot them wherever they are. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that, that's one thing your Montana license does allow you. Actually, I think the Idaho one, your, when you buy your non-refundable hunting license in Idaho, it allows you to hunt grouse also. Okay, cool. So, so that's if, if you were an archery hunter. If you're a rifle hunter um, and you have your choice between Colorado, Idaho, and Montana, because these are the places that have leftover over-the-counter tags. Mm-hmm. If you're a rifle hunter, I'm going to say Colorado. Okay. The second season and the third, they call it the second rifle season, third rifle season. You can buy them over the counter. There's no limit on how many, which if you think about that, that means there's a lot of guys who use Colorado as their fallback. So plan on having a lot of company. Yeah. Especially in the second season. For whatever reason, this when I've hunted and been down there for the second season, the pressure in the second season compared to the third season is a lot higher. Right. And all I can figure is October is a place where a lot of the Midwestern guys, uh, they're, they're not hunting yet. Their season's open in November for deer. So it's like, oh, it fits good to come to Colorado okay. in late October for that second season. So I think there's 90 some units in Colorado that are part of the over the counter system for elk. Wow. Uh, that, is second and third rifle seasons. Now, deer is all on a draw, but elk is, there's there's a lot of these units okay. where you can come uh, on an over-the-counter tag. And, and the reason I say there is because, you know, at least most of the West Slope areas, it, it still happens, but not as much as it does in Montana, uh, and Idaho's a little bit in between, is the elk don't have nearly the private land sanctuaries in Colorado yeah. like they do in Montana. And Once, there's just a lot of elk. There's, too. <laughs> there's a boatload of elk. And I know some of the Colorado guys are like, no, we've been knocking them down and knocking them down. And, and I know you have, but compared to other states, you yeah. can't, as my one friend would say, you can't throw a dead cat in any direction without hitting an elk in Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure where he picked up that that uh, statement, but uh, that's how he says it. <clears throat> um, and there, there are just a lot of elk in Colorado, and the cost in Colorado for the the elk tag is for the bull tag. Anyhow, this year's six hundred and twenty six dollars. Um, what is it going to be for a cow tag this year? I don't know. Usually the cow tag is like 400 bucks, something like that. And a lot of these units, there's leftover cow tags. And in some of the units, you can have a bull tag and a cow tag. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the units I hunt, usually you can have a bull tag and a cow tag if you get. So a lot of times in Colorado, I'll, I'll apply for a hunt that I think I have a chance of drawing based on my points, which this year's moot for me because now I'm back to zero points. But <laughs> I used to apply as my first choice, something that I thought I was in the running for, maybe as a little bit of a stretch. And as my second choice, I'd apply for a cow tag. And I just about always get my cow tag as my second choice. Okay. So then if I've got my cow tag, then I would go and buy my over-the-counter bull tag. So I'd be there with a cow and a bull tag. So if... And that that would, I think it'd take you over budget by like 50 or 60 bucks of, okay. your, of your $1,000 tag budget. Or you say, no, nah, I don't need the cow tag. I'll just go buy the over-the-counter bull tag. So so there you go. Now, if, if you don't want to go to Colorado for rifle, my next suggestion would be Idaho. Um, Idaho has less of the private land complication okay. than Montana. A little more than Colorado, but a little less than, than, or yeah, a little less than Montana. If you're rifle hunting, my last choice of those three states would be Montana. Okay. Just because 
we live it and see it. Yeah. I mean, there, there are elk right now about a mile from my house as we stand here. Mm-hmm. And you can't go shoot them because they're on private ground. Yeah. If you go straight east, it might be two miles east of my house. Um, they get pressured off the public. Yeah. And between weather and hunting pressure, and they've figured it out. Yeah. It's, and there, uh, there's always going to be some elk that are still on public yeah, land, but yeah, there is. it's pretty discouraging when you can go down on a pivot and look at <laughs> 2,500 elk just stacked up there, right. knowing that there's that many less up in the mountains. Right. And you know that, guess what, folks? You're not going to go shoot one of those elk on private because either they don't allow any hunting or they're leased to an outfitter and the outfitter's like, you know what? We don't, if you wanted to come here and shoot a cow, that would chase the whole herd off the ranch and then our bull hunters wouldn't have a chance. And so yeah. it just, it's a reality we deal with in states with a lot of private land. Like mm-hmm. Montana, people don't realize this, but Montana is two thirds private. Yeah. And the further west you go, the more public you get. Kind of like same with Colorado and Wyoming. The eastern sides are heavily private. And as you go west, it gets to be more and more public. But like you were saying earlier too, a lot of that lower ground is private, which is also weather, you know, when the weather pushes them down, that's where those elk are going to go. Right. And that's why I do my Montana elk hunting mostly with a bow. Yeah. And now all my Montana, (laughs) when this podcast releases, there's going to be like five guys come over to my house and put pot knots on my head. (laughs) Newberg just shot it up. Shut up. So for a thousand bucks... Right there. None of those options I listed are more than $1,000 for the tag price. Mm -hmm. And if someone can't afford $1,000 for tags and licenses, um, I I wish it was different for them. I wish they could. Mm -hmm. Um, But that that's kind of the realistic base to have a a strategy. So that's the short-term strategy that you get to go hunting every year. Okay. There's no reason that anyone in America who wants to elk hunt shouldn't be elk hunting this year and every year. Then we get into long-term strategy. Long-term strategy requires a little more budget. Okay. Or reallocation of some of your budget. Okay. And let's, let's, long-term strategies are usually based on one of these elaborate point schemes. And for a long-term strategy, I'm going to focus on a few states, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, and Arizona. All right. And we've already talked about Wyoming, so let's just kind of go into that a little further. You were, you have, what did you say, three or four points in Wyoming? Uh, yeah. For elk, something like I that. think I only have two for elk. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah. So you've started the process of building points in Wyoming. Yep. And... An elk point in Wyoming costs you fifty bucks. A deer point forty bucks, and antelope point is thirty bucks. I think. <clears throat> so for elk, if you want to elk hunt in Wyoming, you may not draw this year, and you may not draw next year. But by the time you start getting three, four, or more points, yeah, you're now in the running for some pretty decent elk hunts. And the most common question I get when it comes to Montana and Wyoming is, where do I hunt where I don't have to deal with grizzly bears? Yeah. (laughs) And I get that. Um, You and I both hunt where there are grizzly bears. (laughs) Uh, And so someday when Randy Newberg's obituary says he's now converted to grizzly shit somewhere (laughs) up in the mountains, they'll go back to this podcast and say, see what you get, knucklehead. Um, (laughs) But the reason I I say that is in Wyoming, there's a lot of really good elk hunting outside of areas that have grizzly bears. Um, The big horns, central Wyoming, southern Wyoming. uh, There's a lot of opportunity there. And if you, once you get to three to five points, uh, that's that longer term horizon I'm talking about. There's some some really good opportunities, some really good hunts in Wyoming. And some people, because they they want to wait and wait and only hunt what I'd call a glory tag, that's fine. I mean, if that's what you want to do, it's not what I'd do. The, yeah. the, <clears throat> I would say that the, the incremental benefit or the incremental quality of a hunt in Wyoming between four points and 10 points isn't worth waiting six extra years. Mm 
Yeah. And I'd say it's even less the case in Colorado. Okay. So long-term strategy, pick one of these states or some of these states that we're going to talk about that, that, that again, is within your budget and start building some points. Yeah. And, and if you want the real predictability of saying, okay, I don't want to buy raffle tickets per se where it's extra names in the hat, then focus on Wyoming and Colorado. If you say, I want to build points in a longer term situation where even though I know I'm behind the curve, every year I at least still have an option, then you go to the bonus point states like New Mexico or uh, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado. Okay. Or, or I, I got that wrong. I need another cup of coffee, Marcus. <laughs> the, the bonus point states would be uh, Nevada, Utah, and Arizona. Okay. So, but all of those states, those three states that I just mentioned, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah, require you to buy a non-refundable license just to start building points. Okay. So, that eats into your budget yeah. really quick. So, if your long-term strategy is like, I just got to hunt elk in Nevada some year, plan on a big part or plan on either getting really lucky right away. I mean, like lottery yeah. ticket type lucky. Yeah. Or <clears throat> plan on the fact that you're going to be buying a lot of non-refundable hunting licenses over the years right. before you luck out and your name gets pulled. Okay. So if I'm not attached to any state <clears throat> and mm-hmm. I just want to work on a, like going up a gradient of a more expensive working my way towards accumulating points or yeah. chances at drawing what you, you said starting in Wyoming. Right. And then mm-hmm. how, how <laughs> can you think of like a general idea of how you would go up to what would be like the most expensive state or the hardest state yeah. to draw a tag in? Yeah. I, I, <clears throat> so I would almost put Colorado as a less of a gradient to build points than Wyoming. Okay. Because Colorado, yeah, you got to front all the money to get a point, Mm -hmm. but you get just about all of it back, like all but 10 bucks. Okay. So to get a point every year in Colorado, you send them your money, you you can pick the option that's PP, preference point, and you know you're going to get all your money back except for the application fee. Okay. So that's that application fee is cheaper than building a point in Wyoming. Um, so, the, but it's my personal opinion that the quality of the hunt you can get for the same number of points in Wyoming is better than what you can gotcha. get in Colorado. So it's, it's a little bit Toss of trade off there, there of, okay, yeah. my 10 or $15 application fee in, in Colorado, is that worth, uh, being a penny pinching, uh, or, or pinching the pennies about it? and maybe have a slightly less lower quality hunt for four points in Colorado than I could have in Wyoming for four points. Okay. So, but to your point about this gradient, yeah, the most expensive and at the top of that gradient is going to be Nevada or Utah. Okay. I'm going to say Nevada because their non-refundable hunting license costs more than Utah. Gotcha. Both of them have ridiculously difficult odds. All right. I mean, like so bad if if you actually subscribe to uh, a service that provides you the accurate odds, and last year when Go Hunt came out with the Nevada odds, they finally came out with the true Nevada odds mm-hmm. because Nevada's got this ridiculously complicated system where no one has really ever said it's worth it for us to spend the money and hire the stat people who can predict Nevada odds because it's it's that complicated. Well, Go Hunt did it. All right. And when they came out with it, I'm like, oh my goodness. I drew Nevada elk in 2007, no, 2005. I will never draw again as long as I live because now I'm back to one point. Yeah, because there's a waiting period, right? And right, there's it. a 10-year waiting period yeah. that I just got off that. But so because I'm applying for everything else, I'm like, well, I may as well pay the 15 bucks for the 20 bucks, whatever, for the, the elk point in Nevada. But, yeah. The odds of me ever drawn again are so slim. Wow. I mean, ridiculously slim. So to your gradient of, you know, where's the slope get really steep? Nevada is, well, it's like $150 non-refundable license. And my odds are really, really low. No matter what weapon type I choose. 
come to Utah, my non-refundable license is cheaper. It's like 90 or 100 bucks. Okay. And my odds are still really low. And there's no. not a whole lot of general opportunity in either of those states? or like No, a, no general opportunity in Nevada. Okay. And the general opportunity that exists in Utah is crowded. It's short period. Um, some of it is spikes only. It just... Okay. I mean, when you look at all that, it's... No, nah, if you're just going to hunt general tags, go to Montana, Idaho, or Colorado. Yeah. So... And then... So you got that. And then in between there is Arizona. Okay. Um, and Arizona, again, has a pretty expensive non-refundable license. And it has a bonus point system. But I mean, if you're willing to hunt some of the less... I hate to say less desirable, but if you just base it on draw odds, mm -hmm. there are some tags in Arizona that you might draw every five or six years. Maybe it's a late rifle tag. Maybe it's a, a tag that not, you know, people aren't that excited about because it seems like the mindset for non-residents in Arizona is this is my home run state. This is where I'm swinging for the fences. I want an archery tag in unit 23. Well, guess what? Even if you got a gunny sack full of points, your odds of an archery tag in unit 23 are pretty <laughs> damn low. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but if if you're willing to accept some of the the other hunts, the especially the late rifle hunts are are more, but they're tough hunts. I mean, I've had late rifle tags there, and the one year we had two two tags leash out of bull the next year we got fogged out three three days out of a five-day hunt that we had booked were we we're completely fogged out uh we we didn't fill either tag that year we should have i uh i missed one so i guess that's that's my problem not uh not anyone else's uh and then the next year we had late tags uh we we shot we filled one out of two tags uh, the guest hunter shot Randy, uh, shot his bull, uh, and then it rained torrentially for the last three days of the hunt. So that, that's the risk of, of the Arizona hunts is they're yeah. short and they're tough hunts. That the, the elk aren't walking around bugling. But if you want to go elk hunting, of those three states, Arizona has better odds of, of drawing attack. Okay, so you have, so, a, I mean, if you're going to, spend a number of years right. dedicated to applying there you have a decent chance you have a better chance than nevada or utah of actually okay but not as good of a chance as colorado or wyoming so that's a good way to look at it like you mentioned a gradient of i would for me if i i'm looking at kind of an intersection of cost waiting period and quality of hunt yeah i'd build points in wyoming first and then using those same factors, the next one is I'd build points in Colorado. And again, yeah, all well, of this gets to budgets. Well, and the hard part too is not only budgets, but like how old someone is. Like if mm -hmm. you're 65 years old versus someone who's 20 years old, you're going to have a different strategy <laughs> of how you're probably going to go about this. Yeah, a, a long-term window for someone who's 22 could be a, it's kind of like investing in the stock market you know <laughs> people will say oh you can recover a couple times if you're 22 if you're 65 <laughs> long term is hey i didn't even buy green bananas at the rest at the grocery store this week <laughs> um so no that's a good point i i again i skip over a lot of that stuff well it's but. hard because it's going to be different for i think the point i was trying to make is it's going to be different for every individual and there's probably no one size fits all solution, but yeah. So with Wyoming coming up, you, you, you mentioned something about Wyoming and this is where some guys are going to just kick me right in the teeth. But if you apply in Wyoming, go to their regulations and you will see there's a little asterisk around a lot of the units and what that little red asterisk means is access can be very difficult in this area. Apply with okay. caution. Yeah. So, and, and some of them, it, even, you know, I, I consider myself kind of the Charlie Daniels of the GPS, man. I, if, there's, <laughs> if there's public land there, I'm going to find a way to hunt it. Yeah. But even 
as much experience as I have doing this, navigating this public-private interface. There are a few areas in Wyoming where even I couldn't solve that riddle to where if they gave me a tag, I probably wouldn't take it because of the public-private problem. Dang. But there's also some of those units that have that little asterisk there that, yeah, that's, I appreciate Wyoming scaring off a lot of people because yeah. every place I apply for elk in Wyoming is one of those spots. All right. It's, why? Because I have the Onyx map system. Yeah. I can pull it up on my phone. I can pull it up on my GPS. I can pull it up on my computer. And I can solve that riddle. Yeah. Some way, shape, or form, I will solve that riddle. And I'm not talking about when we used to do these fly-in helicopter hunts. <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking about that. We did those just in Montana. I'm talking about I will find a parcel where there, it might only be a half mile wide and two miles long, but it extends out into some prime habitat on a private ranch. Mm-hmm. Guess what? If I'm patient and I figure it out, I'm going to find a place where those elk sooner or later are going to be on public. I just have to ex- have the mental mindset that, you know what, probably three out of every four times I see elk, I can't go after them. Yeah. But the one out of four times, I can. And the beauty of it is the draw odds are better. And because the harvest is not as intense as it is on the areas with lots and lots of public land, the age class is usually a little better. So... To your point of, of using that system in Wyoming. Yeah. It's if if people were to see me doing my research, and we keep saying that, and we keep getting asked to do this about once I draw a tag, they want us to do a YouTube video about here's how I yeah. I then plot my strategy to go to a unit I've never been to. The hard part of doing that is how do I do that without giving away and ruining somebody's unit? Yeah. Even if it's a unit I'm really not hunting, but, you know, some guy who has that unit that year is going to be Newberg. You just, you screwed up my hunt. So that's why we really don't get around to that video. I struggle with that. Just have a lot of blurring of name. <laughs> I have to me. blur It'll out every creek, every drainage, every ridge, everything. But uh, if you looked at my, my computers, you know, I got screen left, screen right. When I'm doing this research, I've I've got my Onyx maps up on one side for Wyoming, and then I've got Go Hunt on the other, and I've got the Game and Fish website open, and I've got all kinds of other stuff open. But you you'd be surprised, or people would be surprised, how frequently you can draw Wyoming and have a good hunt. And their general tag, I don't know. It, I wish my my computer is locked up here, but I I don't know what the draw odds are of the uh, general tag in Wyoming. I think it's like with one point you got like a twenty five percent chance of drawing in the in the regular less expensive draw, okay. and if you have two points, you're pretty much guaranteed the general tag in Wyoming. And Again, you guys who hunt these general tags in Wyoming are the ones who are going to call me, chew me out, call me names, because that is a super hunt. It's it's the best two point hunt in North America. Is the general Wyoming tag, and if you look in the applications, they call it G E N Gen General, and it encompasses a lot of units residents can just go buy it so yeah it's going to have hunting pressure but you most of those units you can come and hunt the archery season from september 1st to the 30th and then each of them have different uh rifle dates and you can come back and hunt the rifle dates all right so i don't know if two years is considered a long-term strategy (laughs) i i don't know of a place with a better mix of public land quality and availability of tags every two or three years i don't know if you can come up with a better mix than wyoming's general tag okay that's just my my personal opinion and you know opinions are kind of like armpits everyone's got a couple and they all stink (laughs) but uh so trying to think what have i skipped over trying to make sure everybody gets to go elk hunting this year (laughs) 
I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot of questions that. Yeah, if it's like most of our have. other podcasts and most of our other YouTube episodes, it usually generates more questions than it answers. <laughs> um, yeah. And and I'm not trying to send anybody down a rabbit trail because of this or that. I mean, I have no reason to. It's not like I'm a booking agency where I try to tell everyone, oh, go here so I can then advise you to go with this client that I get a commission for. <laughs> um, so be careful if booking agencies send you a certain direction <laughs> because there's a very good chance they're mo more motivated by what's in it for them than what's in it for you. Um, so I, I just want everybody to go elk hunting. Yeah. And the more elk hunters we have, the more people we have advocating for the cause of wild lands and wild places and elk. Yeah. That's my feeling anyhow. Well, and then hopefully this podcast kind of help. If you are wanting to go elk hunting in the West, hopefully this will help you decide what states are realistic and right. what, which ones you can do. And then I think the other moral of the story is to, if you figured out which states you're interested in, go check out the elk talk on the, on our YouTube stuff. Cause right. that's, yeah, that'll, that goes into a little more depth and you can, you know, look through those videos and try to figure out how to, how you're actually going to apply and right. strategize yeah. for each state. Yeah. Cause each of those videos are like four or five minutes. Yeah. So, actually, I think a couple of them, because it's a complicated state might, might get out to seven or eight minutes, yeah. but it's our best effort to explain how this, how this works. How, how that state's draw system works, what your upfront costs will be, whether it's a bonus point or a preference point system. But our whole mission when we did elk talk last year was to teach people that hunting elk is achievable. It's something you can do every year. Because I remember as a kid growing up in Minnesota, I thought that elk hunting was something only the nobility of the world did. I thought you needed a guide. I thought you needed immense amounts of money mm -hmm. to, to go do it. And then I move out west. I'm like, wow. Yeah, I live here, so it's even less expensive. But if I was still growing up back home in Big Falls, Minnesota, yeah, I could come out and I could do this. If I really wanted to shoestring it and I really wanted to share all the expenses with three other guys, I could probably do it for 1200 bucks thousand if i really really skimped but even if i don't want to share it with a bunch of guys i counting my tags and everything i can probably do it for two thousand bucks easy mm -hmm. and i mean you just got to give up motels and drinking beer every night and uh, you know well all then, that stuff and this is this is a different podcast probably but just like you don't need super fancy equipment necessarily. A lot of the hunt, if you hunt yeah. in the Midwest or back East, you probably have most of the equipment that you're going to need. Yep. Very, very much so. I, I don't know how many people, probably the most common question I get is about firearms. Yeah. And some guys, right. And say, you know, I've only got a 270, but I want to go elk hunting. Well, come out here and go elk hunting and get yourself, you know, my first four bulls I killed with the 270 with 150 grain nozzler partition bullets. And all four of them dropped right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, they were perfect shots. You know, they, they nice broadside 150, 200 yard shots. It's great. Mm -hmm. But I, I get worried when people say, well, I need a new rifle and I need a new this and I need a new that. You know what? If you want one, go buy one and I can help you figure out which ones to buy. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll have some strong recommendations about that. Um, and a shameless plug for how our rifles and low pulled scopes and nozzle ammunitions. But uh, yeah. the, the point you're making, Marcus, is very good. Don't think that you need to go to the sporting goods store and re-outfit yourself with ten thousand dollars worth of gear yeah and a lot of it if you commit that i want to elk hunt every year you can pick up a few new pieces of gear every year and invest in quality gear mm -hmm. so that it lasts you for 10 or 20 years yeah and and you'll be fine yeah I mean, there's definitely a lot of the things that people use is kind of make it more comfortable real, <laughs> right, realistically. Right. Yeah. So, some people confuse creature comforts with necessities. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I've got wall tents and I've come to the conclusion that wall tents, 
They're a creature comfort. <laughs> They're not a necessity. Um, yeah, in November, maybe they are a, a necessity versus our Hilleberg tents that we use the rest of the year. Um, but even then, I mean, you look at how many cold weather hunts we've done where we've stayed in non-wall tent situations. Uh, I, a bow, you know, whatever bow you have that will kill a whitetail is going to kill an elk. I, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So don't, don't let the, I think your point is well taken. Don't let the equipment side of things drive you away from elk hunting. Mm -hmm. And I, I know a lot of people are intimidated by it. And then we've talked a lot uh, on our forum, the Hunt Talk forum, about how we boil it down to a smaller area. Once we draw a tag, how do we decide where we're going to hunt? Uh, in the elk talk series, we've also given the five periods of elk hunting. Mm -hmm. The calendar periods, not or seasonal periods, not calendar, but seasonal periods. Elk, most of our seasons are either early season, pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut, or late season. And in that elk talk series, we go into great detail about what the needs are in each of those seasons and why the needs change. And as the needs change over those seasons, elk go to different locations to satisfy the need. So don't get hung up on, oh, I'm just going to hunt this spot. Well, you might be hunting an early season spot and it's late season and they're not there. Yeah. So hopefully that, that series gets the new elk hunter past the, uh, let's face it, I, I made every mistake possible when I started elk hunting. I was, it was like, I felt like I was the Minnesota Vikings who invent ways to lose football games, I invented ways to screw up an elk opportunity. <laughs> it's like, uh, I'm sure if some experienced elk hunter would have been watching me when I first started, they would have laughed. They would have rolled on the ground laughing at some of the things <laughs> I did, some of the things I tried. Um, so the whole idea of the elk talk series was, don't do all the stupid things I did. <laughs> And hopefully, in, in the Elk Talk series that Marcus is, is mentioning and I've talked about is out on our YouTube channel. Yep. It's in the YouTube channel is Randy Newberg Hunter. Uh, go there and uh, there's, there's, we're up to over 240 videos now. Really? Yeah. You can watch it. There's a playlist called uh, Elk Hunting with Randy Newberg or Hunting Elk with Randy Newberg. Yep. You can watch every elk piece we've ever done whether it's a full episode or a tip or a tactic or equipment or whatever i look that playlist has like 42 videos on it already so and more to come yeah we got we got a lot that that we did this fall that we just need to get around to editing. working on it working on it <laughs> yeah well and and just time for, yeah we're we need a larger infrastructure to this operation. <laughs> right now, it's kind of me, Matthew, or me, Marcus. Uh, my wife, Kim, runs Hunt Talk when I'm not on the road. And then Matthew, when he's, my son, Matthew, when he's not uh, busy with school and work and other stuff. So, oh, WPAs. We need to update the people on the Wilderness Production Assistant okay. uh, resumes. I... I don't know how many we've received. The la the previous two podcasts, or no, one, two podcasts ago and three podcasts ago, we put out the word that we're looking for wilderness production assistance for 2017. Uh, it, it floored me how, how many applications we got. Yeah. I, and I've only been forwarding you the ones that, uh, meet certain criteria and we should have been a little more precise when we threw that out there uh, just because of the logistics of training somebody every for every hunt um, we're looking for somebody who can do it for a longer period of time and a lot of the people said oh I can take a week off I'd love to take a week off and yeah. join you guys it's not practical for us to have to retrain somebody for every trip so we're, the more flexibility and time they have to join us the higher up the the rating <laughs> yeah. list uh they've they've come to, they they ended up uh and also uh their experience with cameras whether it's video cameras still photography and editing 
Well, uh, I think we, you know, there were some really qualified applicants. Oh, more that, more qualified than I am to do, <laughs> do the job for sure. I was thinking some of them might not uh, take over as host of this operation. <laughs> uh, but no, we. I'd say we have a pool of ten or twelve applicants that are way beyond anything I expected we yeah. would get. Um, so. Uh, to all of you who sent in, it's we're still going through this process. Uh, don't think that we forgot about you. We'll we're making decisions here in the next month or so, uh, and I think when we go to Alaska in May, we'll try to bring this person, whoever we pick, to come with us there. It might be a bit of a test run. Yeah. And, if it works, maybe they are the, the person for the rest of the season. If it doesn't work, well, go back to all these applications. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, all of you who sent in uh, your your uh, information and made yourself available for consideration, we really appreciate it. Uh, we had no idea we'd be inundated with this many people and people this qualified. Oof. Like you said, and some of them, some of them certainly should take over my job. <laughs> um, I don't know about yours, but but mine. But so, what else do we have on our list, Marcus? That would make everybody an elk hunter. I think we covered it for now. I mean, there's obviously the application part is only the first step, right? Yeah, and the, you're right. That, well, and I guess it's, yeah, maybe not even the first step. You have to research before you apply really yeah but I, I do think that is the because once you start applying it forces you to do the research yeah so i see again i take that i just have this assumptions of everyone knows this but very good point that there's really application season then if you draw a tag there's research and planning season and then there's the actual hunting season and i spend immense amounts of time in all the above i mean we're sitting here in the Randy room and we've got three whiteboards <laughs> full of <laughs> calendars and applications and deadlines. And yeah, if people saw this place, they'd be like, how do they get anything done in that <laughs> mess he's got up there? But <clears throat> anyhow, I think we're going to have to wrap it up, Marcus. We, uh, we've done our best folks. I, I hope that all of you will go elk hunting this year. Um, uh, you have a short-term plan and a long-term plan, and every one of you should be uh, should be elk hunting. And and one of the things we're going to try to do going forward is I've asked the Elk Foundation to give me information about access projects they've done. And in every episode, I want to talk about uh, something the Elk Foundation has done to improve public access. And for this one, since Wyoming is the the situation. Um, there's an area in the Bighorns of Wyoming called Devil's Canyon that the Elk Foundation and the Trust for Public Lands uh, worked with the landowner and they bought the property and they turned it over to, I believe they turned it back to the BLM, but it made available uh, 26,000 acres of prime elk hunting ground in the Bighorns. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you what unit it is, but you'll figure <laughs> it out. We filmed there. We did an episode there for the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, and my buddy Mark killed a really nice bull. Um, but point point of this is we want to talk about uh, the Elk Foundation because they do so much for elk and for public access. Uh, and they aren't real good about tooting their own horn about all the public access work they do. We just, the Elk Foundation just did one and we'll probably talk about this next time down in Wyoming that I think it was an 80 acre piece they bought and they turned it over to Wyoming Game and Fish and it's going to open up over 10,000 acres of public land. So, but <clears throat> anyhow, folks, thanks for listening. Uh, if you would, go and follow us on our YouTube channel, Randy Newberg Hunter. Uh, follow us on Instagram, Randy Newberg Hunter, uh, and follow us on our Facebook page, Randy Newberg Hunter. Uh, and uh, we, we're we going to be putting out all kinds, as it's application season right now, expect our content to be real heavily weighted towards helping people find places to go and hunt. So that it, Marcus? 
That's all I got. Anyway. That's all you got. Yeah. yeah, I know. That's about all I got too. It's so cold. I don't want to go outside, but <laughs> I know the dog is scratching at the door and wants to go outside, but uh, I think I might just let her pee on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, folks, thanks for listening. Hope you all have a very happy new year. I hope your mailboxes are stuffed full of tags. As long as it's not my tag, I'll be happy for you. And, uh, Really appreciate the support all of you give us. And until the next time, stay warm and stay healthy.